Okay, so since we were done a little bit early with the content uh, for chapter 34 today, we can do a couple of uh, like example problems, um, and just go over a few things for the midterm on Tuesday. Now the first thing I wanna go over again is just like some study uh, tips and techniques since that's usually what I get asked the most of after uh, an exam. So the number one thing I would say, uh, first of all, is to make sure you know the basics because if you at least know the basics and you know how to effectively use the formula sheet, which means you're not just writing down like random formulas that don't really have anything to do with the problem. If you know what your formulas on the formula sheet are for and what type of problems they apply to, uh, picking out the right formulas and getting somewhere with them will get you points. So even if you look at a problem and you don't know where to go, you have no idea how to solve it, if you can just say, okay, well, I know how to you know, find this angle, or I know how to find at least the pointing vector, I know how to find the nodes. Uh, if you can get somewhere, usually once you get somewhere, then you can kind of see where to go from there. So if you don't know how to you know, solve a problem, first of all, just see what you can figure out, uh, what extra pieces of information you can figure out from what's given. And you know, as you're working your way through that, you'll eventually usually see where to go. That's usually my kind of like go-to uh, problem solving strategy when I'm doing problems. I, you know, usually you don't know the right way to solve it right away. So you kind of just say, okay, well, like, what do I know? And then from there, you usually, you know, after maybe doing one or two steps, then you realize the way to, uh, to solve the problem. And the other thing again is obviously to make sure that you write really neatly. Uh, we did have quite a few students on midterm one that like made errors typing numbers in from their paper and typing it into the calculator so getting like the wrong final answer but then having the correct work and we were able to give you um, you know a good amount of points for that because now we could see that you just made you know one little error on your final step as opposed to you know doing the whole problem wrong so make sure you write really neatly make sure you write everything out uh, before you type anything into your calculator make sure that you write it on your paper so that we can follow what you're doing and the final thing is to uh, if you have uh, trouble like testing anxiety where kind of once you see that clock start going I know especially on canvas where you have a clock like on the screen um, I know that can be very like anxiety inducing I definitely would not have liked that if I was a student uh, so what I would highly recommend what I used to do when I was studying for the physics GRE where you're timed as well is I would set up a timer in front of myself as I was studying so if you have an hour and a half uh, on the exam set up a timer, get your phone, set up a timer, and put it in sight so that you, when you're doing your problems and you're studying, you see the timer. And, you know, pick out like four or five problems to do and say, okay, I'm gonna do these four problems in an hour and a half, uh, and get used to having a timer, like, you know, on you while you're studying. Because uh, again, one of the number one problems I have is that students will be like, oh, I studied so much. Uh, you know, and then when I, I kind of ask, like, how long does it take them to do a, a problem, They'll say, oh, well, I did like five problems and it took me five hours. It's like, well, you know, if five problems take you five hours, then when you only have an hour and a half to do five problems, like you're not gonna do very well. So I would highly recommend timing yourself just so that you know, A, how long it takes you to do a problem. If it takes you, you know, an hour to do a single problem, then that's, you know, you need to speed that up and that's, that's not uh, gonna go well on the exam. Uh, and then also just so you get used to having a timer on you and you don't freak out uh, when you actually are on the exam. Because that was the thing I always suffered from was like timer anxiety. Uh, so putting a timer in view of myself while I was studying and getting used to solving problems in that time frame, getting used to solving four or five problems in exactly an hour and a half with a timer on you uh, really helped. That way when you go to the exam, you know, you've had practice with, with staring at a timer while you're solving these problems. So I'd highly recommend doing that uh, if you suffer from that type of uh, testing anxiety as well. Okay, so the first problem I want to go over is a challenge problem. So it's three dots in the book, so that's the most challenging level they have. Um, this is from chapter 32. So uh, this problem, we have uh, electromagnetic radiation is emitted by an accelerating charge. So remember we said that all charged particles, if they're accelerating, radiate energy. So uh, we have a, a, a charged particle that's accelerating. So we have the rate at which energy is emitted from the accelerating charge uh, with a charge Q and acceleration A is given by this formula here. So this is actually called the Lamour formula. Uh, and if you take like 112 
B maybe, uh, you'll probably see this. So, uh, okay, we want to know, so this is the power, uh, the energy per unit time. So the first thing they ask is to verify uh, that this equation is dimensionally correct. So this is always a good habit to get into also in physics is being able to check that your answers have the right dimensions because if you know, you're looking for velocity and the final expression you get is like in meters, you know you made a mistake. So let's check the dimensionality first. So the first thing let's do, we have Q squares, that's the charge, that's gonna be, oops. That's gonna be Coulombs squared. Then we have the acceleration squared, so that's gonna be meters per second squared squared. And then that's all over, six is dimensionless, pi is dimensionless. Epsilon naught is in Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. And then uh, we have C squared, which is meters per second, uh, and then that's cubed. So let's rewrite this just a little more neatly. So we have C squared. Then this m here is squared, so I'm going to write that as m squared. And then we have uh, second squared squared, so that's a seconds to the fourth, and that's going to go on the denominator. Then we have another Coulomb squared. Then I have uh, over Newton's meter squared, so those are both going to go on the top uh, in the numerator. And then I have meters cubed and seconds cubed, so my meters cubed will go down here and then my seconds cubed will go up here. So this all simplifies. Uh, our coulombs cancel. Uh, let's see, we have almost all of our meters uh, cancel because we have m to the four on the top and then m cubed on the bottom. So we'll have, be left with one power of uh, meters. Oops. Then our seconds cubed will cancel uh, and we'll have one power of seconds left on the bottom. So we have now a Newton meter per second and a Newton meter is a joule. So we have a joule per second, which is power, uh, it's energy per unit time, so that's a watt, so our energy, uh, sorry, our units make sense there. Okay, so now let's look at part B. So if a proton with kinetic energy of six MeV is traveling in a particle accelerator in a circular orbit of radius 0.75 meters, what fraction of its energy does it radiate per second? So that's um, a lot to take in, in uh, for one part. So let's just break this down and again, just kind of go through it step by step and not worry about getting to the final answer just yet. So the first thing we have is a proton with kinetic energy of six MeV. So the kinetic energy is six MeV, which is six times 10 to the six electron volts because mega is uh, 10 to the six and remember uh, this is one thing that also uh, trips students up a lot is a capital M is mega, which is 10 to the six. So M is 10 to the six. And then a lowercase M is M to the negative three is milli. So uh, definitely make sure you know all of your uh, prefixes and stuff. So MeV with a capital M is mega electron volts. Uh, so that's 10 to the six. And now we know for this problem, so we know the charge of a proton, uh, we know the speed of light, we know all these constants here. The only thing we don't know is the acceleration. So uh, I believe this is on your formula sheet that the acceleration uh, for uniform circular motion is V squared over R. So we know the radius, uh, we don't know the velocity yet, but we do know the kinetic energy and we are gonna want the acceleration. So then remember also that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And on your formula sheet, uh, the mass of the proton is there. And like I said, also the charge of the proton is there. Let's first find the velocity. That way we can find the velocity, plug it in here and then get the acceleration. And then we're kind of just done. Then we just plug everything into this equation and we have the, uh, the power. So the only other thing we have to do is convert uh, from electron volts. So now if I gave you this kind of problem on the exam, I would give you the conversion for electron volts into joules. I don't expect you to like memorize that. Um, so you would need to convert into joules. So let's uh, find the velocity. So let's first co convert the kinetic energy into joules. So we have the kinetic energy is six times 10 to the six electron volts. And in one electron volt, there is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So this will give us uh, 
9.6 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. So that's the kinetic energy. So this is the kinetic energy of the proton. And now we can just solve for the velocity, right? Because now we know that uh, we have the kinetic energy. We know the mass uh, is on our formula sheet. So the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So now we can just solve for the velocity. So the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. So that means that our velocity is going to be 2 times the kinetic energy over the mass, and then take the square root of that. So uh, this is 2 times the kinetic energy was 9.6 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. The mass is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. Take the square root. And this gives you uh, Three point four times ten to the seven meters per second. So this is the uh, velocity of our proton. So as it's going in that uniform circular motion, this is its velocity. And you can see here that we have something that's less than the speed of light. It's close to the speed of light because it's ten to the negative seven, uh, but it's not quite the speed of yet, uh, light. So we don't have any kind of uh, contradiction or warning sign there yet. So we know so far we're 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 doing good. So now we have the velocity. So now we can just plug this velocity into this formula. We have the radius and we can just find the acceleration now. So we're just going to plug this velocity 3.4 times 10 to the 7 squared divided by the radius it said was 0.75. So this comes out to uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 15 meters per second squared. So this is our acceleration, and now we can just plug everything uh, right into this formula and find the uh, energy radiated per unit time. So our formula was dE dt, which is the power, is q squared a squared over 6 pi epsilon naught c cubed. So that's going to be, so let's do 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, squared is the charge. The acceleration was 1.5 times 10 to the 15, uh, again squared. And then we have 6 times pi times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 is our epsilon naught. And then we have 3 times 10 to the 8 cubed. So there's a lot of uh, powers to make sure that you, you don't uh, mess up there. And again, for uh, for problems like this, what I always do is I always pull out the powers of 10 and do it myself. So you're gonna see this uh, 10 to the negative 19 squared, so just pull out a 10 to the negative 38. Then here we have 10 to the 15 squared, pull out a 10 to the 30. Here, pull out a, a 10 to the 24. And then just do all of your powers of 10 by themselves because uh, you're way less likely to make a mistake doing it that way than kind of just plugging this whole mess into your calculator. You're like almost guaranteed to mess up some, uh, you know, um, parentheses or an exponent somewhere. So try to break up these problems into like all of your, your little factors like 1.6, 1 1.5, 6, all those things, and then all of your factors of 10. Uh, that way also when we're grading, we can clearly see where your mistake is. Um, you just lost the power of 10 somewhere. Uh, okay, so once you're done uh, simplifying all this, you will get 1.33 times 10 to the negative 23 uh, joules per second. So this is the amount of energy that it radiates away uh, per second. Now for the last part of this problem, it just says what fraction of its energy does it radiate per second? So that's what fraction, uh, its energy meaning its kinetic energy, what fraction of its energy does it radiate away per second? So uh, we just have there, that's just going to be the energy that it radiated away uh, divided by the total energy. So the energy uh, that it radiated away, like we said, was just this 1.33 times 10 to the negative 23. Uh, and then the total energy, let's see, we had the total energy in terms of joules was right here. So this was 9.6 times 10 to the negative 13. And uh, my units are okay here because this is 
this is joules per second, this is joules, and this is the energy radi radiated away uh, kind of like in one second, so we have an extra S here. So we have uh, all of our units end up canceling. So uh, again, you'll plug this into your calculator and you end up getting uh, 1.4 times 10 to the negative 11. Okay, so this is the total energy that it radiates away per second. Okay, so the main thing here is just kind of getting all your units in order and like I said, uh, sort of just working through it bit by bit and not worrying about knowing how to solve the problem all at once right away. Now for part B, uh, oh sorry, for part C, uh, consider an electron orbiting with the same speed and the same radius, what fraction of its energy does it radiate per second? So I'm not gonna go over that part, I'm just gonna uh, write down the answer and I highly suggest you try this out yourself because this is a really, really good uh, like challenging problem to try. So obviously if you have questions about how to do it, feel free to email me, but the answer will be 2.54 times 10 to the negative eight. So the electron radiates a little bit more of its uh, a fraction uh, if it's going at the same, uh, same speed and the same radius. Okay, so this is a good problem. I would also really recommend doing the next problem. So this is uh, 32.52, sorry, 51. I would also really recommend doing 32.52. It's similar uh, and again, like a really good challenge problem to see if you really understand the material uh, and kind of get used to doing these tedious problems with a lot of like uh, powers of 10 and, and unit conversion and stuff. Because that's what trips up most people. Okay, so the next problem we're gonna do is chapter, uh, sorry, from chapter 33, number 42. This was a homework problem and I did get a lot of questions um, about this problem, so I just wanna go over it because uh, it also is a, a good, um, slightly challenging problem. So here we have a ray of light traveling in air is incident at angle uh, theta A uh, on one face of a 90 degree prism made of glass. Part of the light refracts into the prism and strikes the opposite face at a point A. Uh, if the ray at point A is at the critical angle, what is the value of this angle of incidence here? Now there's one thing, uh, I don't think that this problem is worded very well because this is one of the problems uh, that students were having on the homework, is that it says it's made of glass, so you might think that the uh, index of refraction is 1.52, but they actually don't want you to assume that the index of refraction is 1.52. Uh, they want you to find the index of refraction, which I think is very misleading. They should say, uh, it's made of some unknown material, so it's obvious that you have to find the index of refraction, right? It would make sense for them to say, uh, you know, you have water and then not use 1.3 for the uh, index of refraction. So if there was a problem like this on the midterm and I wanted you to find the index of refraction, it would be obvious that you had to find the index of refraction. I wouldn't say it's glass and then expect you to find the index of refraction. Uh, so that, that was something that was worded a little bit um, poorly about this problem. Okay, so let's draw some triangles first. So uh, this is the normal here. The normal here, let's say goes like that. And then this uh, is also the normal. So let's draw that a little bit more here. So uh, the first thing we can see, so they give us this angle of uh, 40 degrees. We know that at angle, uh, sorry, at point A, it says that it's the critical angle. So this angle is the critical angle, which means that uh, this beam reflects at 90, uh, sorry, refracts at 90 degrees. So we know that this beam here just goes like that, right? Now the other thing we notice is that these, this angle, oops, this angle right here is 90 degrees because we have a, uh, a 90 degree angle up here. This is the normal to this side. So this angle here is 90 degrees. This angle here is 90 degrees. So that means we have um, you know, a rectangle. So this last angle has to be 90 degrees as well. So then we can easily figure out what this angle here is. So this angle here, if this is 40 and this is 90, uh, that means that this angle has to be 50 right, because we know that our uh, triangles will uh, add up to 180. So we know that this angle is 50, so now we can use this to find the index of refraction. So we're gonna use uh, Snell's law over here. So we have Na sine theta 
a is equal to nb sine theta b, where this is uh, theta a for now. Okay, so we don't know n, so I'll just call that n. Sine theta a, we said uh, that angle of incidence was 50. And then we know that the nb is going to be the uh, index of refraction of air, so that's just going to be 1. And then we know that this is the critical angle here, so that means that the light is refracted at 90 degrees. So we have sine of 90, and we know sine of 90 is also 1. So we just get uh, n is equal to 1 over the sine of 50 degrees. So that comes out to 1.305. Uh, so that's our angle of, uh, sorry, our index of refraction for this triangle. Now we can just do Snell's law again and find this angle of incidence here, since now we have the index of refraction of this uh, triangle. So we can just do Na sine theta A is equal to Nb sine theta B. Uh, and then Na is air again, uh, so we have 1 times sine theta A is equal to 1.305, that's the index of refraction in the prism, times sine of 40, the angle of refraction uh, at that surface here. Uh, okay, so now we just have to do theta A is equal to sine inverse of 1.305 times sine of 40. And so this gives us, uh, we get that theta A is equal to 57 degrees. So this is the final answer for that. Uh, okay, so that's that problem. Now we're going to do uh, 3.49, which was, I think another, I think it was either a homework problem or it was uh, one of the practice problems. Okay, so this was 33.49. Now, uh, this one, they, you, they say that you have two rays, M and N, coming into this triangle here. It has some uh, index of refraction, which they give you as 1.6. And then it says that the uh, angles A here, so this is an isosceles triangle, the angle A is uh, 25 degrees. And they want to know what is like the angular separation between M and N once they exit the triangles, so once they exit this prism. So the first thing we should do for this is just figure out what angle uh, M and N refract at. So let's uh, zoom in here. So it's a little bit, okay, so they come in uh, at this, uh, they come in perpendicular to this plane here, right? So that means that they're not gonna get refracted at this first surface. So both M and N are just gonna go straight through the prism here, and then they'll get refracted right here. So I'm gonna draw another picture because they drew A right over our M and N. So let's get rid of this. So we have, I'll draw it very big. Okay, so we have M coming in like this, and then we have N coming in. They go right through. Uh, this is 25 degrees and 25 degrees. Okay, and then they're going to refract at this next surface. So let's draw the perpendiculars. So the perpendicular lines we'll say are like that and like that, let's say. Okay, so that looks good. So now how are these going to uh, refract? Well, we have to use uh, Snell's law, obviously, but we don't know what angle of incidence they have yet. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of geometry to figure that out. So since they both, uh, this is an isosceles triangle and they're both coming in parallel, we know that whatever this angle, sorry, uh, this angle of incidence will be, this angle will end up being the same since you know these two scenarios up here are identical. So let's look at this top part first. So we have a right angle here. We know that this whole thing is a right angle as well. Now we have a triangle here, obviously, so we can right away figure out what this angle is since we have 25 and 90. So if we have uh, 25 and 90, that will give us 65 for this angle. 
So we're going to have 65 here. And then if we know that this is uh, a right angle, we know then that this angle also has to be 25. So this angle is also 25 right here, since that all has to add up to 90. So we can see right away now that the angle of incidence is 25 degrees. And that's going to be the case for both of these. So both are going to have an angle of incidence of 25. So now let's use Snell's, Snell's law and figure out how they refract from that second surface. So we can just use Na sine theta A and B sine theta B. So Na, uh, they gave us is the index of refraction inside the medium. So that's 1.6 times sine of 25 is equal to uh, outside is air. So it's just going to be 1 times sine theta B. So you take the sine inverse and you get that theta B is equal to uh, 44.5 degrees. So this is uh, the angle that they refract at. So we can draw this, it's going to kind of go like that. So this angle now is 44.5 degrees. Okay, so that's uh, then going to happen here also. So we're going to have 44.5 here. Uh, I'll write these in red actually, so it's a little bit clearer what we found. So we've got 44.5 and 44.5. Okay, so now let's, we're going to have to do some more geometry now. So let's move that over here so we have more space. So you can see that the outgoing rays are going to intersect, right? So let me draw this a little bit uh, neater. So like this one's kind of coming like that. So you can see that they're going to intersect. So these two rays are going to come like that. And then this one will come like that. And they're going to intersect here. And what we're looking for is this angle theta. So they want to know the rays get refracted, they intersect, and then they um, like separate once they, they intersect and they go their separate ways. So we want to know what is this angle theta here? Well, we're going to have to do obviously some more geometry. So let's, now there's a couple different ways you could go about this. Um, so I'm just doing the first way that came to me. So what I did was I just uh, like kind of separated into a triangle like this. And then I wanted to find this angle here, because if I found this angle here, I know that that's going to be the same as this angle. So I just like drew a little bisector there. That's going to be the same as this angle. And then all I have to do then is just double this angle, and that will be the same then as this angle. So I want to find this angle first. So I have here, let's see, we have another right angle. So we've got a right angle there. And then we can see that this angle in here has to also be 25 because this line and this line are parallel. So we have here and here are parallel and they're uh, intersecting the same line here. So that means this angle and this angle have to be congruent. So this is 25. Uh, then we can figure out what this angle is because we know this here is a uh, right angle since this is uh, perpendicular to the surface. So we know that in here, we're just going to have 90 minus 44.5. So now we can just figure out uh, this angle here. So I'll just draw this triangle again so it's a little bit clearer. So this is a right angle at 90. This entire angle now is going to be 70.5. So just add 25 plus 90 minus 45 will give you 70.5. And then all you have to do is just figure out, well, you know, the angles add up to 180. So what is this angle? This angle comes out to 19.5. Yeah, 19.5. So now all I have to do is double 19.5, and then I get this angle here. So 19.5 uh, times 2 will give me 39. So my angle now is 39 degrees. So theta is 39 degrees. So, okay, so that was uh, 33.49.
So again, this is a, a good like challenge problem because it uses a lot of geometry. Um, and it's not, you know, exactly obvious how you're going to go about solving it once you first start. Okay, and then we just have one more problem left. So we're going to go over uh, 33.45. Okay, so now we have uh, 33.45. So we have, uh, let's see, we have two thin lenses with a focal length of magnitude 12 centimeters. So the magnitude of the uh, focal length is 12 centimeters. The first diverging and the second converging. So let's draw that. So the first lens they tell us is diverging, so it's going to look something like that. And the second lens lens is converging, so it's going to look like that. So then we have uh, we know that the focal length of the first they tell us the magnitude is 12, but it's diverging, so it's going to have a negative focal length, right? Because remember, a diverging lens is also called a negative lens because the focal length is negative. So that's 12 centimeters for the first one. And then the second uh, focal length, so F2, will be positive 12 centimeters. And then they say that the, uh, mer the lenses are 9 centimeters apart, so this distance is 9 centimeters. And uh, an object 2.5 millimeters tall is placed 20 centimeters to the left of the first diverging lens. So we have a little object here. So we have some little object here, and it is placed 20 centimeters to the left of the first lens. So that means that our first distance S, we'll call that S1, is 20 centimeters, and it's a positive 20 centimeters because we'll say our light is coming from the object, so our light is coming from this direction. Uh, Okay, and its height is 2.5 millimeters, so that means Y1, the height of our first object, is 2.5 uh, millimeters. So the first thing we want to know is how far from this first lens is the final image formed? So we're going to have, uh, when the light goes through this lens, it will form an image somewhere, then that image will act as the object for the second lens, and then that will form an image. So we want to know uh, where is that image, first of all. So let's do that. So let's first find the image uh, from the first lens. So we'll, call, we'll say uh, lens 1. So we have 1 over s plus 1 over s prime is equal to 1 over f. So we have uh, 1 over the first object distance is 20 centimeters plus uh, 1 over s prime is equal to 1 over negative 12 centimeters is the focal length of the diverging lens. So this gives us a image uh, distance for the first lens of negative 7.5 centimeters. So that means that our image is negative, so that means it's on the same side as the incoming light. So our little image is right here, and it is some distance, uh, it's 7.5 centimeters. So it's to the left of the first lens, because uh, we also know that a diverging lens will create a virtual image, uh, so it's going to be to the left of the lens. So uh, now we can use this as the object for our second lens, so we'll do lens 2 now. So we're going to use the exact same uh, 1 over s, 1 over s prime formula. But now our object, so our object distance now, is going to be this entire length, right? Because now we're looking, uh, this is our new object. And so it's going to be 7.5 centimeters from here and then another 9 centimeters. So our object distance is a positive 16.5 centimeters because it's on the same side uh, of this lens as the incoming light, so it gets a positive now when it's the object for the second lens. So, okay, now we can just uh, plug this all into the formula again. So we get 1 over 16.5 plus 1 over s prime is equal to 1 over positive 12 now. So then we solve this and we get, this is the second image, uh, we get for the second image uh, 44 centimeters. So that means now that our final image is over here, and it's 44 centimeters 
from the second lens. But in the problem, they're asking how far from the first lens is the image formed. So we have to add nine centimeters to our 44 to get the distance from the final image to the first lens. So that will just be 44 plus, they were nine centimeters apart, so we get 53 centimeters. So it's 53 centimeters and it's uh, on the right. Okay, so now uh, that's part A. For part B, is the final image uh, real or virtual? Well, it's on the right of a converging lens, so it will be real. And then, uh, let's see, then part, so part B, and then part C, what is the height of the final image? Is it erect or inverted? So we need to do the magnification. So now let's do the magnification. So we'll do uh, the magnification for lens one. So let's see how much is magnified when it goes through that first diverging lens. So the image distance of the first lens we said was negative 7.5, right? So we have negative, negative 7.5 the object distance for the first lens was positive 20. So we have a negative, negative 7.5, so we have a positive 7.5 over 20, and that will give us a positive 0.375 as the first magnification. So the first magnification, you can see it's positive, so it's still upright, uh, and it's about a third as tall as the original image. Now let's do the magnification once this object now goes through the second lens. So we have still negative s prime over s. So our so our image distance for the second lens was 44 centimeters. So we do negative 44, uh, and then the object distance was 16.5. So we do 16.5. So for that, we get, uh, this is negative 2.66. So then to find the total magnification, we just multiply these together, right? Because uh, our original uh, object has been shrunk to about a third of its size and is upright. Then that object then gets uh, magnified by 2.66 times, but then is inverted because of the negative sign. So our m total is uh, 3 point, sorry, 0.375 times negative 2.66, and this actually comes out to negative one. So our final magnification, the object, or sorry, the image, is the same size as the object because it's, the magnification is one, but it's inverted because of the negative sign there. Okay, so that is it for that problem. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, all the problems I had uh, planned for today. So again, let me know if you have uh, any questions at all about the uh, procedures for the midterm or any questions about uh, you know any topics, whatever. Definitely let me know. Uh, I'll be around my email all weekend. Okay, and then the, uh, the other thing also uh, I forgot to mention earlier is the withdrawal date for uh, classes has been moved back. So normally the withdrawal date has already passed, but the withdrawal date actually is Wednesday. So I'm going to post the solutions for the midterm uh, basically the same day as the uh, midterm. So pretty much right after we're done that afternoon, I'll post the solutions. That way, if you're worried that you might have to withdraw, if you don't think you did as well as you wanted to, you can see the solutions and get an idea for how you did. That way you can still make that withdrawal deadline. Uh, on Wednesday if you want. So Tuesday we'll have our midterm, Thursday there's no class because of Thanksgiving, there won't be homework due on Sunday either, uh, not, not this coming Sunday, next Sunday. Um, this Sunday you do have homework for chapter 34, but the next Sunday after Thanksgiving there won't be any homework due, uh, so you'll have the whole, uh, you know, little holiday weekend to relax and not have to think about physics. Um, and then we will try to get you back your midterms again, uh, you know, a week after the exam. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's it, good luck.